started, but um, yes, hello and welcome to faculty office hours. We're really glad you're joining us today for a faculty office hours in mathematics. And we're joined by two of our esteemed faculty members. Uh, we have Kyle Ormsby and Nick Davidson, who are both here and you know excited to talk to you and be able to share some more information with you about their department, a little bit more about Reed and their experience as well. And to try and maximize the time that we have, we're gonna you know, do a little bit of an introduction, you know, allow both of our esteemed colleagues here who have joined us to just provide an introduction of themselves. We'll then spend a little bit of time hearing from them as they kind of break down a little bit more about their department and their major. They might you know, share some slides with us so we can kind of get better sense there. And then we'll open it up to a Q&A. So we definitely want to speak to things that are on your mind, speak to your questions and your curiosities. And I would imagine most people are pretty Zoom familiar at this point. But in case you're not, there should be the Zoom chat feature right kind of at the bottom center of your screen. And you can either chat the questions that you have generally to the room. If it's something you want to send privately, you can you know, send that directly to me, so over to Grant Sewell, and I'll be able to you know, make sure our presenters kind of speak to it um, with the time that we have. But with that in mind, I will go ahead and turn it over to Nick and Kyle to kind of get us started with an introduction when you're ready. All right, well, um, go, go ahead, Kyle. Uh, I'm going to try to get the screen share going. Awesome. All right. Well, uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Kyle Ormsby. Um, you're welcome to call me Kyle. Uh, I am a mathematics faculty at uh, Reed. Uh, this is my eighth year at Reed, I believe. Um, it's been a, a wonderful place to grow as a scholar and get to know the exceptional students that come through, um, build relationships with them in classes and thesis projects and undergraduate research. Um, and also get to teach just some really cool math. I think we do math in an exciting, uh, rigorous, uh, just very intellectually stimulating way at Reed. It, it's a pleasure to teach. And um, uh, I think most of the students uh, get a lot out of it. So um, my research myself uh, is in a field called algebraic topology, um, which is a very fancy way of saying that I use uh, numbers to think about shapes. And um, I, I've managed to do uh, a decent amount of research with students on that topic. Uh, my colleague Angelica Sorno and I uh, run a summer research program uh, where each summer we work with four or five students and typically get a, one or two research papers out of that, that process. So um, I, uh, I am excited that you're uh, thinking about Reed and uh, happy to answer your questions as we go along. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Nick. This is my third year at Reed. Before I was at Reed, I spent some time at University of Oklahoma, University of Oregon, and uh, MSRI, which is a math institute in Berkeley. Um, so let's see. Right now, I'm teaching Intro to Statistics. Uh, so that's Math 141 at Reed, and we'll talk about that in just a little bit. But uh, in the past, I've taught things like calculus, um, topics in algebra, uh, abstract algebra, and things like that. Um, my research interests are if I'm feeling fancy, uh, I say that they're in quantum super algebra, which means um, I spend lots of times looking at formulas with the letter Q in them and figuring out where I put or where I'm missing a Q. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I'm excited to have this chance to tell you about the department a little bit. And um, let's see, I think the plan was to start with the curriculum. Let's see, we can see with the slides. Okay. All right, Kyle, you want to take it away in the math curriculum? Absolutely, yeah. So uh, this is the reformed math curriculum. Uh, we updated this about, uh, I want to say, five or six years ago. And uh, what you can see here, oh, my dog is going to join us. This is Asa. I, okay, I know I didn't give you your supper. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> the wonders of work from home. Uh, okay, so uh, what we have here is... He's really going to make me feed him. Uh, no, I'm going to keep going. So uh, we have Math 111 and Math 113 as uh, entry points to the math curriculum. So those are classes where you don't need uh, any preparation beyond two years of high school math. Um, calculus is a uh, relatively normal um, introduction to calculus. It's both uh, differential and integral calculus in the same semester. Um, discrete structures is uh, a course that focuses on three topics, um, uh, 
combinatorics, um, finite probability, and uh, number theory. Um, and it's an introduction to problem solving. It's an introduction to working collaboratively with peers on uh, difficult math problems. And it's also uh, a place to learn about proof techniques and how to, uh, how to write proofs. Um, Math 112 is our introduction to analysis course. Um, this sort of gets under the hood of calculus and says, why does all of this work? Um, so I, I think everyone on the faculty firmly believes that students have the right to, to know, the right to understand uh, wh why things happen, not just a kind of cookbook approach. And um, an out intro to analysis is really uh, figuring out, you know, what is the real number system? Why is it like that? And, you know, how do, um, why do all of these theorems uh, hold in calculus? Um, from there, we go on to linear algebra, math 201. So if you've seen thing like, things like matrices and linear transformations and eigenvalues, um, that's what that is. Um, but we do it in a, a rigorous way. Um, that class, along with math 113, feeds into abstract algebra, um, the only uh, one of the 300 level um, requirements for the math major. Um, and it also feeds into vector calculus, uh, which is also known as uh, multivariable calculus. Um, so uh, that's kind of a unique sequence. Most colleges would have uh, multivariable before linear algebra, but by putting that course in the language of linear algebra, we're able to go through the material in a much more mature way. Um, and then the only other remaining required course in the curriculum is real analysis 321, uh, which is a deeper dive into things like measure theory um, and pieces of uh, uh, calculus that, that uh, are, are yet to come. Um, from there, uh, there are a number of topics courses uh, that are available to students, and here you get some freedom in choosing uh, the sorts of uh, things you want to focus on, um, especially the, the topics courses, topics in geometry, advanced analysis, and algebra. Those are interesting ones because you can actually take them multiple times for credit. Every time they're taught, they're different. So one year geometry might be non-Euclidean geometry, and another year it might be polytopes, and another year it might be Coxeter groups, um, and it'll keep shifting topics um, according to the faculty's interests uh, and student interests. So um, I think that's a, that's a bird's eye view of the curriculum. Um, and uh, our students uh, certainly come away from this experience as uh, really strongly trained uh, mathematicians ready to go on uh, either into graduate study, industry, uh, teaching, you name it. Yeah, I'm sure. Uh... Uh, some of you have like been hearing from the admissions folks what types of st stuff read students go on and do uh, after they graduate but um, read students tend to do lots of exciting things, uh, including grad school but also uh, industry work and things like that too. Uh, actually, maybe I think Kyle might have just dropped out to uh, go feed his dog. Is there any questions about the math curriculum before I talk about stats curriculum. Okay, so Harold just asked, if you've already taken courses in linear algebra and vector calculus, how would that affect the course progression? So um, typically, first year students, we expect them to come into either Math 111 or if they've had um, some calculus experience in high school, um, uh, many students take Math 112. In some rare situations, students will start with linear algebra. Um, I'm not aware of any circumstances where students have uh, started all the way up to vector calculus. Uh, Kyle has more experience with this. Yeah, um, so I, I think uh, issues of placement like this are often handled by sort of direct conversations with faculty members. And so it really depends on exactly what approach your courses took to those subjects. Um, but we tend to be able to work with students to find the right place to enter the curriculum so that it's you know, not boring, not repetitive, um, but also you're prepared to launch off in that course. Um, so in rare circumstances, uh, students start pretty far down uh, this chain of classes, um, but by talking with one of us, we'll figure out kind of the right spot to, to get you started. And I think um, these types of conversations, they've been moving, traditionally they've happened right before classes started, but I think they're trying to move these more towards uh, summer so you can get your schedule set a little bit earlier uh, instead of right before classes start.
All right. Well, if there's no more math questions, I can talk a little bit about the stats curriculum. Uh, so this is the stats curriculum compared to the math curriculum. Uh, so math curriculum, we had an abstract algebra course down here. Uh, that's been replaced by these TEAL courses. So uh, the TEAL courses, these are the theoretical stats classes. Uh, so 391 is probability and 392 is mathematical statistics. Uh, 391 is, right, so probability is um, the branch of math that's concerned with or uh, studies uncertainty. Uh, so this is like a deep dive into the theory of uh, probability and uncertainty. Um, and the reason we do this is that gives you a lot of the theoretical foundations for understanding um, the techniques that are used, used in statistics. So um, uh, these classes, uh, 391 and 392, they're usually, uh, students try to take them during their third year. Uh, as far as classes that you'd be more likely to take as a first year student, uh, for stats classes, you would probably be starting uh, at, in Math 141. So uh, Math 141, this is a modern take on a traditional intro stats class. So uh, the class uses R, which is a statistical programming language. Uh, and R is a major part of the course. So it's kind of embedded in everything that we're doing in the class. Um, one of the reasons we like to use R is it lets you quickly get up to speed on um, using modern techniques from stats. So like the stuff that statisticians are actually using now. Um, and that's kind of in contrast with uh, what happens in a lot of AP stats classes. So uh, AP stats uh, tends to use things like uh, calculators or uh, Microsoft Excel or Google Sheets or something uh, to do analysis of the data. Uh, in Math 141, we use R. And for that reason, it's very rare that students who have taken AP stats get credit for Math 141. Um, in almost every case, uh, students will start in Math 141. Uh, and actually, students who, even if you have taken AP stats, um, you will learn some stuff in 141 that you hadn't seen in high school. So, uh, for example, um, some of the stuff we do in that class includes uh, using R to do randomization and simulations um, for statistical inference. Um, bootstrap confidence intervals is a thing that you learn about there that you typically don't learn in an uh, AP stats class. So um, there's really a lot going on in that class. Uh, okay, so then once you've taken the intro to probability and stats class, uh, there's kind of two other applied stats classes you can take. Um, one is data science, so that's 241. Um, that's focused a lot on the mechanics of how to work with data uh, and how to analyze data sets that have many variables, uh, and then how to like take your uh, analysis and visualize your answers and then communicate them in a non-technical to a non-technical audience. Um, I don't know. So I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with the website 538 that does lots of stats. Um, but you're right, they also have like really nice graphics to communicate uh, the statistics they're trying to communicate. And uh, 241, you're kind of learning how to make graphics like that uh, and do visualizations. Uh, okay, and then 243 is another applied stats class that you can take. Uh, 243, this is statistical learning at Reed. Um, it gives you an overview of how statistics can be used to make predictions in lots of fields like biology and astrophysics. So for example, um, it was taught this last fall and I didn't teach it, um, another one of our faculty members taught it, but um, one of the things they spent time on is what characteristics of mushrooms predict whether they're poisonous, right? So like maybe the size of the mushroom or the color of the mushroom. Um, so they were using statistics to try to uh, figure out what's the best thing you can look at on a mushroom to see if it's poisonous. It turned out the best predictor was, does it smell like almonds? Okay. so. Uh, <laughs> Maybe maybe that's a subtle scent that's kind of hard to pick up when you're smelling a mushroom, but uh, that was the best predictor they figured out, but they used stats to show that that was the best way to predicting um, whether a mushroom was poisonous. Uh, so then after you've taken 241 and 243, you have lots of modern tools for doing statistics. Uh, then the next course would be 343. So uh, 343, this is stats practicum. Uh, it's a team-based class. So you get in a team, you have a project, you spend the entire semester working on the project. And uh, it takes you through um, the entire data analysis pipeline, right? You've got your data, you like wrangle your data to put it in a form that you can work with it. Uh, you ask questions about the data, you analyze the data, and then at the end of the semester, you present your results uh, to a non-technical audience. Um, outside of what's listed on this slide, there is also occasionally uh, topics classes for stats. So like uh, elective classes for students who are interested in stats. I think last year there was a course on spatial statistics. And uh, this year, 
Um, this year, I think they're teaching 343 uh, stat practicum. But uh, next year, I think the hope is that they'll be able to teach a course on uh, stochastic processes, which is another interesting class for uh, stats and probability students. Uh, any questions about the STAT program? Uh, well, everyone's thinking there were a couple of questions about math that came up in chat um, that were answered there, but uh, for the sake of the recording, um, uh, one, uh, we had a question about uh, whether Math 111 covers sequences and series, and um, typically those are uh, focused on in Math 112, the Intro to Analysis course, um, and are handled rigorously there. Um, and I also wanted to mention that uh, if you've taken uh, the AP calculus exam, then uh, certain scores on those exams will place you out of Math 111 so that you automatically are eligible for Math 112. Um, but stats questions, anyone? Okay, so it uh, looks like Doran just asked, are all of these classes semester long? How many would we take in a semester? Uh, yeah, so I, every course he listed here and on the math page is a semester long course. Typically, read students take uh, three to four, um, read, we call them units. So uh, three to four units in a semester. Um, during your first year, because Hume, uh, you have this like in humanities class, you take your first year, um, which it counts as like a class and a half, it's one and a half units. Uh, so that means first year students are often either taking three and a half units or four and a half units, but you should think of three to four classes per semester is typical. Okay, so uh, Ellie just asked, could a high score on the AP stats exam place us out of 141? Um, so if that's a thing that uh, you think would be appropriate, I think uh, there's people in the faculty you could talk to about whether um, we would uh, place you out of 141. With that said, we typically don't have students place out of Math 141 just because uh, so much of the class uh, has R built into it, this stats programming language. And um, that's uh, being able to use R, this programming language, is so built into the other classes in the stats curriculum. Uh, that we usually require students to take 141, even if they've uh, taken AP stats before. But that's uh, that's a thing you could talk to an advisor about or one of our stats faculty members. I was going to say, um, Nick and Kyle had one question that was messaged to me, and it, I guess, speaks a little more broadly to mathematics and statistics overall. But uh, someone was curious how conference style learning works in STEM focused classes and since you're talking about classes and curriculum, I didn't know if you might be able to touch on that. Yeah, I'm happy to field that. Um, so it, it varies class to class, instructor to instructor, um, but I can highlight that there are definitely some uh, very interesting approaches to instruction um, that do happen in the math department. So um, for instance, Math 113, this discrete structures course, um, that's, uh, almost universally taught as a, a flipped class where there are reading assignments and maybe uh, video lectures to watch before class. And then the time in class is spent doing collaborative problem solving with peers, um, with the instructor there as a sort of guide and mentor uh, through that process. Um, there are also instances of, you know, sections of calculus and math 112 that are being taught in uh, an inquiry based fashion, um, where students are actually uh, producing the, the proofs of the theorems um, live in class, and that's uh, what's happening there. Uh, there are also courses that look um, a lot more like a lecture where the professor is up there talking about linear algebra, writing theorems on the board, writing proofs, giving examples, um, but probably engaging the audience, uh, the students in the class, um, stopping with short activities or short questions to keep folks um, on their toes and thinking about the, uh, the mathematics that's happening. Um, so it's pretty varied, uh, but um, yeah, the classes are capped at 24. Um, so you're gonna be in a smaller group. And when you get into the upper level classes in mathematics, those are typically more like a dozen to 15 students. Um, so you really get to know your peers in the class and really get a lot of um, sort of uh, direct time with the professor. 
And uh, maybe not exactly answering the same question that was asked, but related. Uh, Kyle was saying that uh, some faculty choose to teach their classes like a flipped class or really active learning. Um, one of the things I really like about Reed is uh, Reed gives instructors a lot of freedom to teach classes the way that they think is appropriate. Um, right. So the idea is that they hire people that they trust to teach classes well. So just let them uh, teach them well. So um, maybe not necessarily in terms of instructional techniques, but um, in terms of like the things that are covered uh, in 111, uh, it's tip, it's frequently the case. So that's calculus that um, some sections are taught as variants, for example, right? So a faculty member will say, um, I really want to teach calculus, but I want to teach a calculus class that would be great for students who maybe have seen calculus before and they want to have a different perspective on it. So um, they have this variant class for uh, students who are interested in kind of a non-traditional uh, look at calculus. Or um, this last year I had uh, a calculus class that I taught because for students who are specifically interested in biology and chemistry. And uh, we spend a lot more time on things like differential equations to understand problems from biology than a normal calculus class would. So I really do kind of like the flexibility in the curriculum where faculty can teach classes the way that they think is best for their students. Uh, so I noticed uh, John in the chat uh, asked, will math classes be structured around tables in a way where students can work with each other? Um, actually, what we have is a number of classrooms that have uh, these really nice uh, desk chairs that roll around. So uh, it makes it kind of flexible where, uh, you know, if it's kind of a lecture uh, session then everyone can point at the chalkboard, but then when they break out into groups, folks can just rotate their, uh, their desk chairs around and uh, talk to each other. But that was, that was from Jasmine, apparently, not John. Uh, got a little <laughs> login uh, name issue. Uh, thanks, Jasmine. All right, well, uh, if you have more questions about curriculum, feel free to uh, keep chiming in in the chat. Otherwise, we'll uh, keep going with uh, this discussion. Uh, Kyle, do you want to talk about undergrad research? Yeah, I'd love to. So um, doing research as an undergraduate at Reed is uh, definitely an opportunity that you can seek out um, if it's something you're interested in. Um, outside of the thesis experience, which is, of course, uh, super important, um, it's not required uh, in order to get a, a math degree or a math stats degree at Reed. Um, but I think it's a really amazing opportunity um, to both do some novel work, contribute to uh, mathematics or statistics as a field, um, and also get paid. Um, so uh, this especially happens over the summer. Um, various faculty will run uh, typically eight to 10 week programs with small teams of students um, where they've sort of uh, broken off a piece of their research program that's accessible um, and they'll get folks up to speed and get them working typically in groups um, to try to make progress, concrete progress on important problems. Um, we have a number of fellowships that are available to students. Um, so uh, those were generously funded by some alumni donors. Um, and uh, an emeritus professor's family, um, but they will cover a um, uh, pretty reasonable wage uh, for eight weeks of full-time work. Um, so that kind of frees you up. So instead of, I don't know, working at the local Arby's, um, you can think about mathematics all summer um, and still uh, pay your bills. Um, we definitely encourage those students to go on and give uh, talks, uh, whether it's at a research conference or an undergraduate research conference or the joint mathematics meetings. Um, and there's also a poster session that's held um, for all of math and natural sciences um, in uh, the early fall um, uh, after everyone's come back to campus. Um, Nick, do you want to talk about thesis a bit more? Oh, sure. And actually, um, before I lose track of it, a question popped up in the chat from, uh, I hope I'm saying this right, Abriana, uh, who is asking what the uh, physics math major is like curriculum wise. So um, I think uh, this was just phased out, Kyle. Am I right about that? Yeah, that's right. So math physics, you might find um, some some residue of that standing interdisciplinary major on the website, um, but it won't be available for students um, coming in next year um, as a standing interdisciplinary major. Um, so uh, 
that doesn't mean that you can't do a lot of math and physics at Reed. Um, and it's also possible that you'll find a thesis topic where there's a math faculty and a physics faculty who say, yeah, let's team up and make uh, an ad hoc math, physics, interdisciplinary thesis and, and major happen. Um, but it's no longer a, a standing program at Reed. Um, I can get into the details of why, but I, I think that might get a little bit lost in the weeds. Uh, it's worth mentioning. So there's uh, the big interdisciplinary major that we see lots of math majors in is uh, math CS interdisciplinary major. Uh, there's a few other interdisciplinary majors around campus, uh, but there's also uh, what are called ad hoc interdisciplinary majors, which is uh, right. If you're really interested in math and really interested in physics and you really want to do an interdisciplinary major, even though it's not uh, one of the uh, current ones uh, that's available to all students. Uh, there is a process where you can uh, design what your major, what you want ma your major to look like with uh, advisors uh, in, say, the math and physics department. And then uh, there's a petition process where faculty can vote about whether this is an appropriate degree program. But uh, there is a way to create uh, interdisciplinary majors. Uh, philosophy math is another one that we had a student do a few years ago. Um, I think there's been a, like a political science math one uh, a few years back. So. Um, they do exist. Yeah. Uh, I noticed here, Samir asks, uh, how common is a math CS double major? Um, so the terminology can get a little funky here. So math CS interdisciplinary, extremely common. Um, and there's a standing program. Um, I think in a little bit, we'll talk about some thesis projects that came out of that, that program. Um, double majors at Reed, that means that you're literally getting a math major and separately a full CS major. Um, those are really uncommon. Um, and really any double major is uncommon because that would mean that you have to write two theses. Um, so uh, it does happen every now and then, but uh, yeah, typically um, students just have a single major at Reed. Okay, and then um, it looks like we left off on thesis. So a thesis, this is a year long program or a year long project that students work on. Every Reed student works on one. Uh, to me, this is one of the characteristic features of Reed is the opportunity to work on a thesis project. So the way this works is uh, in the fall, right about the time classes start, there's kind of this, uh, uh, there's students circulating around the hallways, meeting with professors and professors have all these great ideas for thesis projects. Maybe students have great ideas for thesis projects too. Uh, they try to find a faculty member who's excited to work on the project with them. Uh, we're always excited to work on lots of different things. And then um, there's, right, students fill out a proposal of what they want to work on, who they want to work on it with. And then the department sort of, uh, see, I think it's actually Kyle who uses the analogy that it's like the sorting hat in Harry Potter or something where uh, to assign thesis advisors. So you get a thesis advisor sign, assigned to you. Uh, you spend, uh, it's typically like once a week, you'll meet for an hour to talk about things. Uh, your thesis advisor maybe initially will just have you reading some things. Uh, to try to get caught up to speed but then um, at some point you might like prove a new theorem and do some exciting new things uh, if you don't prove a new theorem that's quite all right expository theses are also very common uh, and they can be a lot of fun to advise right so this would be a thesis where you go out and learn some really interesting math uh, and maybe write it down in a way that another undergrad could understand um, because it only exists like in journal articles or something or uh, maybe you uh, do some uh, reading on like several different sources and you like find a new perspective of uh, how to think about the material and you write that down. So um, both uh, thesis projects where you're doing original research, uh, those are always fun to advise, but then expository thesis where you find some existing math and maybe put your own spin on it. It is a lot of fun too. Okay, uh, let's see, Julian, I just saw a question pop up. What is the path taken by people deeply interested in both math and physics if there is no interdisciplinary major? Oh, um, I, so I should say I do have lots of physics majors who take my classes uh, who are very, very interested in math too. Um, and I, there is lots of room in both the physics and the math major to take lots of classes in the other one. So even if you don't necessarily have on your degree that it says you were both math and physics, uh, you can still get lots of background in math and physics. Uh, and that doesn't necessarily um, 
uh, change your opportunities in the future. It isn't like you have like more opportunities to do something because you were math and physics instead of just math or physics. Um, but then the interdisciplinary major, uh, since uh, it doesn't officially exist, like I said, there is a petition process if you just really want to have this interdisciplinary major, um, even though it's not a standing uh, major anymore. I was going to say, I had a student message me a question um, with the curiosity if either one of you could share like some memorable theses you've advised or like uh, a couple of theses that come to mind and you you must have read my mind is that's where it looks like where we're going next. So I'll that's just where we're going next. Back to you. All right. Uh, yeah. So maybe I will leave this first this first one Kyle was on. Uh, so maybe I'll leave that one for a second and let him talk about it. Um, the second thesis project, uh, Lucas Young. So Lucas was a math CS major who I had actually never met before. Uh, this was, I worked with him in my second year at Reed, um, but I didn't have an opportunity to meet him in my first year. So uh, he read that I did, was interested in things like uh, quantum algebra, like I said at the beginning, and not theory. And uh, he heard that this had something to do with quantum computing. Uh, or more specifically, a specific uh, area of quantum computing called topological quantum computing. So he was math CS. I did some quantum stuff. And he said, do you want to work on this project? And I said, I don't know anything about quantum computing, but I would love to work on this project. Uh, so uh, we put our heads together. Uh, we spent a full year learning about uh, topological quantum computing. It turned out it had a lot more to do with my research area than I was expecting initially. Uh, so I got to learn some stuff. Uh, Lucas got to learn some stuff. This was co-advised. Uh, interdisciplinary theses are co-advised. So uh, I co-advised this with Jim Fix, who's in the computer science department. Jim learned some stuff too. Uh, so it was a lot of fun. And uh, after Lucas graduated from Reed, he ended up going to University of Oklahoma. Uh, he's a math PhD student there right now. Um, so then uh, Kyle's going to talk about Albert in just a second. Uh, this third student, uh, Nick Chayachikorn, uh, so he was advised by one of our colleagues, Luda Korobenko, uh, who's in her uh, maybe fifth year here at Reed. Um, so his thesis was three easy pieces in harmonic analysis. Uh, harmonic analysis, this is a uh, subset of uh, an area of math called analysis, which is what Luda studies. Um, and uh, he's, he's kind of been doing some interesting stuff. He's been doing a lot of stuff related to social work since he uh, graduated from Reed. And um, I just checked and he is currently a research assistant in the Portland State University's Department of Social Work. So, um, right, some, some students graduate from Reed and they go to math grad school. Uh, a lot of them do other things. So uh, Nick is doing social work. Um, I have a thesis student right now who just really wants to bake bread for a living. Uh, so he's a great thesis student. We're learning, having a lot of fun doing not theory, but um, maybe you want to open a bakery after you graduate from Reed and that's great too. All right, Kyle, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Who is that? They're going to have amazing pretzels. Uh, oh, that's that Eric Becerra. I'm, sure. I'm so excited. <laughs> uh, sure. So I'll talk about Albert G's thesis. Uh, this uh, was one that happened last year. Uh, it was a math CS thesis that um, I jointly advised with Mark Hopkins. Um, Mark knows a lot about machine learning and neural networks. Um, I uh, don't know anything about those, uh, but I'm excited to see how uh, various pieces of mathematics might fit into some of the really exciting applications that are happening there. Um, and it turns out that there's a, a big uh, cornerstone theorem that uh, says that a neural network is capable of approximating well um, just about any function. Um, and that's that's their job, a neural network uh, via training and gradient descent to uh, approximate these functions. So you want to know that they're robust and they have the ability to tune the parameters so that they match um, a function arbitrarily well. Um, and so Albert's thesis was to go in and find uh, the original source for that result. It was an incredibly, incredibly terse paper in uh, computer science. Uh, conference proceedings um, that packed, you know, close to like a, a full undergraduate curriculum of math uh, into like seven pages. And so uh, Albert did this really amazing job of unpacking that into sort of a digestible uh, format where uh, anyone coming out of an undergrad math program would be able to understand this this cornerstone theorem um and he uh then additionally did and I, I think a lot of theses ended up 
end up this way where they have kind of a big expositional component. And then he had a few uh, sort of exploratory directions at the end where he was taking his new deeper understanding of this material um, and trying to better understand kind of the typical shape of a uh, neural network derived uh, function. So uh, that's what that was about. And Albert is now um, off in computer science graduate school um, at UCLA. Uh, before I go to the next slide, do we have any questions about thesis or anything else we've talked about? All right. Kyle, do you want to talk about STEM gems and SLM? Absolutely. Yeah. So um, this slide here is, is just kind of about um, the ways that community is built and supported at Reed. Um, so uh, maybe before I get into those particular things, just the organic stuff that happens in the Reed math department. Um, we have a lounge. I think this is uh, like a really underrated part of what makes Reed math uh, tick and work. Um, the faculty are all up on a hallway in the third floor of the library annex. Um, and right at the top of the stairs, um, there's a really nice space that was just remodeled um, where students collaborate on problem sets. There's an entire wall that's it's a chalkboard wall um, where they can uh, you know, write and work on problems and then work together at tables. And uh, yeah, it's, it's just a, a fun place and, and often quite full of students working together. Um, we also have a weekly colloquium that brings the department together where a speaker comes in from uh, typically outside of the college and talks about some exciting math. Um, and that's a place for people to get together and chat as well. Um, additionally, there's uh, the group STEM Gems, uh, which is a group for uh, gender minorities in STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Um, and they connect gender minorities um, it, within Reed. I think they typically have like a, a brunch with faculty uh, once a semester and other activities uh, for community building. Um, we also have in the mathematics department, the uh, social liaison mathematics group or SLM, which is a, a math pun uh, that I won't explain. Uh, and uh, the job of this group, it's a, a faculty appointed group of students with a sort of twofold mission. Um, first of all, to facilitate bi-directional communication between faculty and students, right? Make sure that everyone's on the same page about, you know, if their problems do arise in the community that, you know, faculty know about it and the students know how faculty are trying to respond and things like that. Um, but then also to promote social connections. Um, so they uh, hold a, a student colloquium where students present cool math. Uh, you can see a picture in the bottom right there of, um, oh, there we go. <laughs> uh, in the bottom right there of uh, the annual hike that the department uh, hosts in the fall, or sorry, the SLM hosts in the fall. Um, and then we also had in 2021, uh, a book club focused on the intersection of uh, social issues and mathematics. Um, so uh, lots of cool community building stuff happening in the department and definitely uh, ways to insert yourself into those groups if uh, that's the kind of thing you'd like to become engaged with uh, when you're at Reed. Uh, one of the things that I do like about uh, SLM, so that's this uh, social liaison mathematics group. So in the fall, uh, like the committee is selected and contains uh, three members. Uh, and then in the spring, they always add a first year student. So uh, SLM, uh, after your first semester, you'll have the opportunity of joining this, uh, this social liaison group in mathematics. Uh, and I think it is really good that we pull in the perspective of first year students. Um, uh, in that uh, spring semester. All right, so I think that's it for our slides. Do we have any other questions? I had a student message me a question with, um, a point that I think you both have touched on a little bit, but what might be a little bit different about being a student at Reed versus maybe like a, a research institution or, you know, um, like a, maybe a, a more overtly STEM focused institution, if there's anything you both might want to highlight on that. 
Yeah, well, I think um, the first piece is just access to faculty. Um, so at a large school, um, probably most of the uh, lower level mathematics, 100 level, 200 level mathematics courses are being taught by graduate students. Graduate students are great. I was one, one time. I taught one of those classes. I think I did an all right job, but um, at Reed, you're definitely gonna have uh, a faculty member there uh, from the get-go and just a ton of access to that faculty member. We all hold office hours um, and those are places, um, it's not where students are intruding in any way. It's uh, really an opportunity to come in and ask your questions, uh, explore topics more deeply and fully. Um, so that's a, a really um, great way to get to know um, your faculty. Um, I think, uh, you know, beyond that, uh, it read, you know, it is a, a liberal arts college. So you are getting um, that kind of other side of, uh, you know, education, um, which I think is just ever more important, you know, as we live in a, a data driven and uh, math and technology driven society, um, being able to think deeply about, you know, how the work, your technical work that you're doing um, interfaces with um, issues around whether it's social justice or democracy, um, those are those are important things to be able to do. And I think Reed is, is finding ways to equip uh, students with with both of those toolkits. Yeah, so um, another thing that uh, I wanted to point out, so um, I guess, it, right, if you're a math major at a large research institution, uh, as you get more advanced in your degree, you frequently have the opportunity to uh, take like courses which are like cross-listed at the graduate and the undergraduate level. Um, but uh, one of the things I do like about Reed's curriculum, which is different from uh, uh, other undergrad focused institutions that I've been at is uh, the curriculum is set up. So uh, you start in calculus and it's sort of, it's a non-standard track that we put you on. Uh, but the advantage is that you've taken up through a real analysis class, typically in your third year. So then you're able to spend most of your third and your fourth year at Reed uh, taking electives. And lots of the electives that we offer are um, things that you don't usually see an undergrad curriculum. So uh, I taught a representation theory class two years ago, um, which is typically not taught at a uh, undergrad institution. Um, but then, uh, I don't know, I think uh, Jamie Palmersheim, one of our colleagues taught a class, on, uh, let's see, I think it was Fourier analysis on polytopes. Uh, this is like nothing that you would see uh, at most undergrad institutions. So uh, there's lots of variety. And uh, I think Reed does a good job um, given that we have a small faculty, we do a great job of teaching a broad range of uh, classes that students typically wouldn't see until they're at the graduate level at other institutions. Um, I see a question in the chat from uh, Doran, uh, who says, uh, how well does your curriculum support someone who's interested in data science? Um, beyond maybe a stats or CS math joint major, how much room is there to go deep into that field? Um, so first off, I think stats or math CS would be excellent preparations um, for a career in data science. Um, I think that that word, I, I might like to hear more, Doran, about uh, what you are kind of envisioning by data science, because it's become a, a bit of a, a buzzword. Uh, it can mean different things to different folks. I, I do think that, you know, stats, uh, math stats would prepare one really well for uh, being able to contribute in, in those fields. And um, so uh, one of the things I like about, so I'm a mathematician, I'm not a statistician, uh, but I am teaching Math 141 this semester. So this is the intro stat class and it's a lot of fun. But um, one of the things that's kind of nice about the fact that we get students working with R uh, right, up, right at the beginning is uh, that intro class is, uh, it actually has lots of components of data science in it. You are doing data wrangling in there um you are doing like modeling and things like that um so things that typically might not be taught until like a higher level data science class at uh, other institutions um, but then on, in addition to that we do have the data science class uh, the statistical learning class uh, and then the stats practicum where you kind of put those things together so um uh, i don't know uh doran how interested you were in like going beyond what was contained in those classes it's worth mentioning though that Reed has had pretty good success with stats students winning national awards uh, for stats projects that they've been doing. Um, I wish I remembered the details. There was a group of, I think three students 
who uh, took statistical learning uh, last semester. And in the course of the semester, they started working on a project together for the class, which turned into a big project. And um, I wish I remembered the name of the award, but there was a national award that I just heard about them winning. Uh, and then we also have a, uh, it was a math stat students last year who, um, oh, and I wish I remembered the name of this award. See, uh, I should have prepared this. Um, Simon Couch last year uh, won first place in a national award for uh, his work on um, a statistical programming software. He uh, made some uh, packages for R and he put together, put, that he put together and he won a national award for that too. So um, our students historically have done very well. Um, kind of uh, both in terms of what they're learning at Reed, but then when they go out and do competitions outside of Reed and things like statistics and maybe data science too, uh, they've been doing very well in those competitions also. I think we have time for maybe one more question. And I did get a student who was curious, like I guess maybe in the context of new or incoming students, like how you know, students kind of adjust to Reed's approach like grading and feedback, like in your department. And if that's anything that either one of you could speak to. Yeah, so um, grading and feedback is, is super fascinating at Reed. Uh, so uh, most of you are probably aware that, um, oh, Irving, go, sorry, one second, my five-year-old. Hey, buddy, oh, we'll pick it up, we'll pick it up tomorrow, okay? <laughs> sorry about that. Um, <laughs> So uh, where was I? Uh, okay, so you might be aware, uh, you don't get a report card at the end of the semester, but you have earned a grade at the end of the semester. Um, if you want to know your grades, uh, you can set up a meeting with your academic advisor um, to find out what they are, and, and that's fine if you wanna do that. Many students choose not to, and we typically uh, talk of this in terms of uh, de-emphasizing the importance of grades. What's really important at Reed is, you know, how much you're learning and growing as a student. So um, most math faculty, um, I, I think in some format, all of them um, are still giving feedback in the form of points more or less on problems. So you're going to be doing problem sets. Uh, you'll likely have exams either in a in-class take-home or oral format um, and you're going to get some kind of numerical and written feedback on all of that work. Um, what you're not going to get is a bunch of comparisons with the other people in the class um, and you might not even get a tally at the end of your homework saying that you total got this out of this many points. Um, instead uh, the expectation is that you're using that as um, formative feedback, right? Things that are going to help you understand where there might be uh, gaps in your understanding and, and then use that to grow. Um, so I think that there's this whole system really hinges on there being good lines of communication between faculty and students. Um, and I think the math faculty and faculty at Reed in general uh, take a lot of care in uh, communicating with students and making sure that they understand how they're progressing with the material, uh, even if it isn't coupled with that sort of more traditional um, carrot and stick uh, grade model. No, thank you for that, Kyle. And I think we are at our time. And so I wanted to offer a tremendous thank you to both the, the faculty members who joined us. So a thank you to Kyle, a thank you to Nick. We, Really appreciate you taking us behind the curtain with mathematics and statistics and sharing more about yourselves and the work that you do. And for those that you who were able to join us, we really appreciate your time and engagement, your thoughtful questions. We hope we'll see you at some upcoming faculty office hours. I know we have some for Greek, Latin, Mediterranean studies coming up, political science this weekend. We also have a Q&A event with Dr. Carnell McConnell Black, our VP of Student Life, which should be really exciting this Saturday. And please get in touch with us with any questions we weren't able to get to. And that would be at admission at read.edu. But with that, I wish everyone a great rest of the day. I know we're getting folks joining us from all over the world. So it might be morning, afternoon or night, but I hope everyone has a great rest of uh, the day in front of them. So thank you all so much.